still works out. <laughs> Our marketing team is very, very eager and always like maxing out the, the pizza orders. Um, and which are, by the way, um, you know, kudos to Ink Tank today. Uh, and we have um, Ian here to talk about it. He flew in from Denver for the talk. And uh, as you guys probably know, that's why you're here, the set is a very popular alternative to uh, you know, storage backend for OpenStack, you know, it's, it's the latest, latest way really when it comes to distributed storage. So I'm excited about what Ian has to say today. And um, also, if you want to go and tweet about this, how awesome we are, um, or how awesome the talk is that Ian is giving, then you know, use OSATX hashtag. And I just um, tweeted out a link to the PDF of the slides if you want. I'm going to fly pretty fast through some of them just due to time constraints, but right. I'm going to go back and dig through. So, I, you know, he, he, he has like 30, 30, 45 minutes, something like that, um, to, to talk to. Uh, and then if you have questions after, obviously, we will happily take questions. Also, um, if there is any ideas or things that people are interested in in terms of you know, content we should be covering, people should, should be inviting, um, always happy to. Uh, probably Twitter is the easiest way to communicate back to us. So, yeah, anyway, I'll give it to you. All right. Start out tonight, we're going to talk about OpenStack and Ceph. First of all, why am I standing in front of you guys? Well, why? I'm the Ceph program manager at Ink Tank. Uh, we'll get in uh, a little bit later into the presentation of the relationship between Ink Tank and Ceph, but my job is to make sure that really smart guys keep cranking out awesome Ceph code. And there's all my contact information on there. So we're going to start out by how do you select the best cloud storage system? Before I do that, how many people here have already heard of Ceph? I'm not, okay. How many people here have played with Ceph? How many people here have contributed to Ceph? Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
That's pretty good, though. I, I'm impressed. Okay, then, then I don't need to sell you a lot on this, but a cloud storage system, people are looking for open. Sorry, but if anybody in the room here works for DDN or EMC, the writing's on the wall, your days are numbered. <laughs> Why is that? Because this is what a disk drive looks like. Uh, I'm going to take some of my valuable time to share a little story from my um, storage admin days. I worked in a uh, classified space at an aerospace company, and we had a, an issue with 73 gig drives. They made me go through all these monkey hoops to show that it was not due to our data center's humidity, not due to our data center's temperature. They said it might be cosmic radiation. Well, finally, when we took down all the serial numbers and they did a trace and went back to uh, an unnamed vendor, they found out that, oh, yeah, we got a manufacturing problem. So I had a 73 gig SDK drive, which this is not necessarily, um, fail on me pretty much hourly. That's so flashing lights were a common scene in the data center. You know what constant rebuilds do to your RAID? Not good performance. Now imagine that if you're talking about a million drives in your system. You're going to lose 55 of these a day. Now, one cool thing was, because we had to destroy them all by hand, because of the environment I was in, we had to send back all the faceplates. I got a lot of cool magnets to take home with my kids. <laughs> but other than that benefit, I don't think you guys want 55 of these a day to be having to destroy. So, how do you get around that? Well, okay, you, you guys got it. You're, you're using OpenStack, okay? Maybe you're using Swift. Hmm, what are you doing for block? Well, why would you want to care about block? Maybe you can do everything with just objects. Everybody's used to block storage. It's, it's comfortable. It's familiar. I'll let you read all the other <coughs> So now let, let me get just to the head-to-head. -head. In addition to the fact that we offer object and block, and I'll go through the whole stack quickly of everything we offer, what do we have? that Swift doesn't have. And I'll be fair later on. I'll, I'll show you a couple things that they have that we don't have. Reduce administration costs. I'll go into what our crush algorithm does and how we protect your data and call it self-healing. The fact that we do that without anyone in the loop saves you on administration costs. You don't have to have an administrator like the Swift who says, oh crap, there's a failure better set up the ring differently. Also, we guarantee the consistency of your data, even with large volumes. With Swift, because of our sync, what they're using, if you get enough volume, you may get some slow async replication, and who knows how stale your data is. Now, I told you I'd be fair. These are, some, these are a couple of features which some people think are very crucial, and these are areas that Swift have that we don't. So for quotas and object expiration, we do not currently have those in set. They are currently implemented in Swift. They're on our roadmap. Um, we're going to have a set design summit, which I'll talk about later. We're going to talk about the architectures of those, but those are looking to be implemented in a release that will come out this fall. So comparing the two solutions, why would you want to consider Seth if you already got Swift? Well, as I said earlier, we've got object and block. And we've got self-healing without operator intervention. And think about the poor guy that you don't have to send there to update the ring configuration all the time. OK. Now, you, hopefully, I've got you a little bit interested in Seth. Most of you already played with it. So I'm going to skip a lot of this just to cover the general architecture. RADOS stands for Reliable Autonomous Distributed Object Store. That is the heart of Seth. Everything builds upon that. That is our object store. Everything interacts with that. Then we have Librados, the library, and I'll go into each of these more in depth than the gateway, which is uh, equivalent to S3 and Swift API compatible, uh, the block device, and our file system. So we've got each of the areas, file, block, object, covered there in one system. So let's just start at the bottom. How does the RADOS work? You've got a series of monitors that are the brains. You have to have an odd number. 
you don't want to start with rain. So if they're trying to decide how to make decisions, the monitors talk to each other, they get it for them to make a decision. The OSDs, that's the object storage daemon. Okay? <laughs> Not to be confused with object storage device. For some reason, we decided we just want to confuse everybody by changing the meaning of that well-known acronym in storage. <clears throat> we recommend that you have one of these per device. Now here's a, here's a typical layout. So you've got the object storage daemon on top of your lower level file system. You can use ButterFS, ext4, XFS. Currently, we're recommending XFS. We'd like to see ButterFS get to the place where, where we could recommend that. We're also playing with ZFS on Linux, but we haven't fully implemented that. So that's an area that we're just looking at. And then you've got your underlying disk. Okay, this is one system comprised of multiple OSDs. You've got your odd number of monitors managing it. Now, the interactions with that, it looks like a single device. Yeah? On your file system slide, you guys are recommending XFS and RFS and C4. Um, are you going to talk about the trade offs at all between using different file systems for it? Because it seems like that's a pretty big decision I have to make up front. And so choosing the right one is pretty important. Choose I can tell you we played with ButterFS on it and there were some, some issues with it, but I don't and found a lot of good documentation mm -hmm. explaining why you choose one file system or the other, why XFS is recommended back when we started with ButterFS is recommended. And um, and there are certain considerations to into account there. I was not going into the underlying file system. If you want to come talk to me afterwards, I'd be happy to follow up with you later. But yeah, right now we're we're currently recommending XFS. We we believe that the roadmap for file systems is pushing towards ButterFS, but just because of some of the limitations within it, that's why we're kind of hedging our bets and playing a little bit with ZFS on Linux. Okay, so back to that. <coughs> it just looks like a big single entity. So that's the Rados. Now, how do we interact with the Rados? Well, we've got LibRados, which are a series of native libraries available in pretty much pick your flavor of language. And that allows you to have native access directly to the object store. So C, C++, so whatever, you can interact directly with the object store and use the library. Now, here's an example. So you've got an application. You linked it in with the library. Again, as long as you're using one of those common languages, you've linked it. You're talking natively with this as one big object store. No matter how many OSDs you have, how many monitors. Okay, so we've got building up again. So one of the applications which we've developed, which uses, which takes advantage of this LibRados interface, so the Rados is the Rados Gateway, or RGW as we call it. You may see it both ways, uh, abbreviated RGW or Rados Gateway. And that is both S3 and Swift compatible. So you can send your either version of commands and we'll handle it. So we've got some people that have played with writing, I don't know why, but writing with an S3 and reading with Swift. One, one important thing I didn't mention is this is RESTful interface. So if you're common with that, I mean, if you're familiar with that, it's a common uh, API interface. And so that's what allows you to interact with the gateway via the Librados. And then, and then again, because you're using that library, you're talking natively to the Librados. Rest-based, buckets, counting. <coughs> now the one that, that I think most of us are really interested in for OpenStack is RBD, which stands for Rados Block Device. It's in both the Linux kernel <coughs> and in user space. How does it work? Well, 
you can pick your favorite KVM, QEMU. Maybe I'll just like Sam, QEMU. <laughs> Okay, it goes to another library, libRBD, which talks natively to the libredos, into the, the object store. So this allows you to store your virtual disks to stripe them across the object store that we've created in that underlying Grados. And some of the significant scaling you can get from that I'll talk about later. Now, what's the last component? So, we've, again, we're working up. We've got the underlying object store, gateway library, we've got block, now file system. This is probably the least robust of the three main areas of the object block and file, simply because of focus. Focus of the team has been on um, building the object and block, and for um, the future focus will be on the file system and all three and really hardening them all. But so if we, the kind of caveats we give is that you'll see some people say, this is awesome, this is awesome, this is awesome, this is almost awesome. So we would say, hey, put this in production, put any of this in production. And I don't know if I want to put this in production. Okay. It's that file system itself is just not quite there yet. There, certain things like it doesn't do an FS check and things that we consider to be a necessary part of considering an enterprise or a distributed parallel file system that just aren't there yet. All right. I kind of talked a little bit about this um, when I was describing the self-healing aspect of Seth. What, what, makes, what makes it so self-healing? Crush. This is uh, the controllable replication <coughs> using scalable hashing. That's a fancy acronym for watch how we spread your data. <coughs> so, if you've got an app and it's got to decide where to, what to do with your data, it's coming in here. You got compute and disk there. How does it know where to, what to do with it? Well, one of the ways is you've got a list. You just got a, some metadata server or something here that says, okay, I know where everything is. Come ask me and I'll tell you where to put it. Another way is where it knows the layout. So you, you tell it, okay, I do my ha when you do your hashing here, everything that falls in this range, throw it in those racks, in this range, throw it in those racks, maybe in this range, this different data center. And it always knows that's where it goes. But it's it's kind of kind of like a, an old fashioned phone book. It's one of the way I've heard it described. Um, but when was the last time anybody looked up something in the phone book? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I, I can't wait till my my kids. Yeah. I, I have an eight year old, two eight year olds, and a six year old. They're gonna have to the phone book. Now, so what's the difference with Crush? First. Here's your data. Bonus points for anybody that can break that out. Okay, split that first into what we call placement groups, or PGs. So we take your data, and you configure how many PGs you want to split that data in. We recommend approximately 100. For this example, I've given you a nice small 10, just because it's these pretty slides. Don't do that. You will have two lumpy of data. Yeah. Do you uh, specify this per cluster, per Argos gateway, per? I mean, where do you specify? It? You specify that in your crush map. And okay. let's see that one. So you got the number of PGs. You split the data. Then you run it through the crush algorithm. And so it takes this block, and it says, "Okay, I'm going to put one copy here, one copy there." This is a pseudo-random <laughs> algorithm. So it's always repeatable. <coughs> no matter how many times you run it through there, it's always going to wind up knowing where to put it based on how you split up your data and the configuration of your system. Let me explain more about that. So <coughs> you tell it in your crush map, I've got 10, let's pretend these are, these are servers, 10 servers, and maybe you tell it 
okay, I want a replication of two. And uh, maybe these are on different power lines. So I want to make sure that if this power feed goes down, I don't lose everything. <coughs> and if this power feed goes down, I'm covered over here. So what you'll see is when it, when it pushes all of your data through the crush map, based upon those rules that you have created, it decides, okay, I need two copies. I'm going to put one white one here, one white one there. Okay? Get with the maroon one. One here, one here, and so on. The other thing that you'll notice is it's smart enough to know, well, I can't put both of them in the same box. And also, just because your rules said, okay, I want them on different bus rows, so one right here, one right here, I'm not going to throw another blue violet one in here because I got one here. So you'll never see the ident exact identical clumps of data in, s in the same OSDs. So does the client get the right commit <coughs> after write full copies or after one copy is there? One. Okay, so if you have a slow note, that one will prevent the client from being the right. Right. Does, does can, this you, can you trigger that for certain rules? I mean, if you had something that you needed, you needed to have synchronous copies of, or would you do that through, say, the SWIFT interface and inside SWIFT, you probably would. That's how you recommend that. And we'll, and we'll get to one other quick question yeah. here. Uh, you should take into account available capacity of those nodes or CPU utilization on those nodes as well when it places? No. So just to summarize, here's what this box is doing. It's spreading it around based on the infrastructure topology. It's not looking into the things, like you said, that doesn't have that smart to do it. So you set up, I've got data centers, I've got racks, here are my rules. It doesn't have enough smart monitoring built into it like that. Would, would the system work well if you had nodes of different sizes or capacities or performances, or is it really the algorithm better if you have a homogeneous system? It can perform in a heterogeneous system, but it would work better in a homogeneous system. But, I mean, if you if you set up the rules, so you would, you would basically have, you could have different pools. <coughs> so if you want to do a mixed iron SSD kind of thing, you can do that. So here again, we've got, how do we know where to put it? Runs through the algorithm, picks the right box to put it in. But now, what happens? Uh-oh. Something went down. What do we do? So you notice all these guys are talking to each other all the time, which is one of the reasons that I said when you created those PGs, which were the, the different colors there. That's why I said we typically say you want to do about 100, maybe 200 if you're really crazy. But if you get up and you just want to play with it and you say, oh, I'm going to make it 1,000, well, what happens is you're, crea you're creating extra overhead for all the OSDs to communicate because you're spreading your data now over all these different <coughs> OSDs that are constantly saying, hey, you still there? Hey, you still there? And what happens in this case is they said, oh, not here. So these guys know, all right, here's my, we call it our friend. Here's my friend, okay, because he had red and yellow. So we're friends, the two reds. Well, my friend went away. Oh, crap, what am I going to do? He knows my friend went away. What am I going to do? Well, we know based on your rules that you require two copies. So immediately, the crush is going to rerun your system, the algorithm, to see based upon this new topology now. It's not just going to use the old one, okay, and then take those away. It's going to say, okay, based upon the rules that I've been given and knowing that this guy's not here anymore, where do I put a replica? Okay, I'm going to put a red one here, <laughs> one here to compensate for him being gone. So you say immediately. I assume it's not immediately. It's a time out of some sort. It's like the network you don't want to start with <laughs> Quickly, rapidly. And is that tunable? I don't know that. That's a good question. So, so the effects of the rebound. I mean, it, 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 as opposed to just relocating those two blocks, is this a global rebound? No. Okay. So an example. It's not going to shuffle everything. It's only going to re 
recreate those blocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, those objects that are missing. In the example you gave, you have these on, on two separate buses, say. Um, so you lose bus two. All the blocks in bus one start to freak out. Uh, do you have an arbitration system going on where it will, it will quiet them because it's not going to be able to satisfy the, uh, the requirement? Yeah, if it, if it can't satisfy the crush rules that, that you've established, then yeah, it will go ahead and try to rebalance as best as it can. I'll just say, hey, I'm out. I, I, can't, I can't satisfy what you, what you told me to do, but I'm going to do my best. And it'll probably spew lots of error messages. He has spares. Spares? Yeah, can you have a spare server where you can set up? Oh, yeah, you can have a, you can have a hot spare. That, that'd be up to you to then mark that up and then it re, you know, you'd mark, that's where you would actually have to have somebody in the middle <coughs> trying to show us the kind of the self healing aspect of it. To whereas before, you didn't have to do anything and your data is just taken care of. You know, it's replicated in the rules that you set. Now, if you want to come in afterwards, which most of us would want to, would say, okay, pull that guy out, slap in a new one, and then run it again, and it replicate all over. I'm just, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is, is the uh, additional replication help in any way of the uh, read uh, throughput? Like, does it take advantage of that? Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. Okay. Especially with the block. <coughs> What's the other thing that makes Seth cool? So here we're talking again about in the, the block device. We've got your one block device is striped across all these different objects. That's what we're displaying here is you got a little bit over here, a little bit over here, all these different places. So what can we do to take advantage of that? Okay. If you want to spin up a thousand VMs, do you want to take up a thousand local nodes? Well, what we allow you to do is, here's one image. Okay. Now, let's just make some clones. So here in this example, I've made four clones of this image. It didn't cost me anything. See, it's, it's, there's, this is just totally in logical space. I didn't take up any additional space my system. Now, I get a client that's coming in here and he wants to write four different objects. Okay? So now, rather than rewriting this whole thing, I'm only writing the new objects. So on this, this is one block device, this is a clone. Instead of taking up 288 objects, I'm taking up 148. So what do I do when I need to read? When I read, I'm smart enough to know, is the data the same? Oh, I'm just going back to the original. Is the data the same? Going back to the original. Oh, data is different. Okay. I'm going to go to the clone. So for this guy, all he's got used space-wise is this four little object. Sorry, so what's, what's the API compatibility? We'll get to that. <laughs> what's, what's the limit on number of clones? There is none. The only thing, the only but, is that you can't do anything with this guy as long as he's got a clone. So if for some reason you decide you want to blow him away, you can't until you've also blown away all of his clones. Now when we get to the future, uh, another feature that's coming this fall, when you get to live migration, then you maybe you won't care. Maybe you could have a thousand copies of them because you'll just if you want to move whatever's underlying storage he's on, you'll migrate him to something else. Trash that, bring in some new storage. So is this mapping sitting on this? It sits on disk. You're suddenly getting two reads for every read. Is it? Say that again. When you try to read a block, mm -hmm. first it has to figure out where it's at, and then second it has to read the block. So if this mapping is not stored in memory, you're doubling your I/O. No, I, I know what is what is coming from the clone and what is coming from the original. 
so I don't have to do a lookup. But it's stored in memory on this. Yeah. No. No. It's right. You have stored for just for persistent, but with the app that you have. And your single generation on the clients. Yes. Now, okay. How does this work with OpenStack? You're asking about API support. I've got a nice little picture that describes these words, but we were initially uh, part of OpenStack way, way back in Cactus. I say way back. Uh, we've increased the features each time. You can use Swift, Keystone, Cinder, Nova, a bunch of different ways to, depending on how you want to talk to it, how do you want to use Ceph. That would depend on which API you use. Now, the big thing, which I was kind of frustrated we didn't get into Grizzly, but uh, it, it is going to be in Havana, is that you'll be able to create an RBD volume from an image in the Horizon UI. So that will, that will be in the Havana release. So just from your UI, you can click, and it'll set it all up for you. It's not there yet. So here's kind of a prettier picture that shows exactly which of the APIs you use to, to work with each of the various areas of set. So if you want to do identity management, your typical Swift uh, or your Swift stuff to talk to the gateway, Keystone Swift. Then if you want to talk to RBD directly, you can come right in with Cinder and talk directly to uh, the RBD device. And again, this is just kind of showing we've got that thin little Rados that's everything else is sitting on top of that helps you talk natively to the Rados. And then with Nova, via your favorite hypervisor, then you can talk to the block device. Plants, would you point at RBD or would you point that at Swift? Yeah, I mean, would you have to stand up with Swift and point it at that? Could you point it at the RBD? I have to think about that. Are, is your system able to keep all these recoveries and redundancies when it's got a hypervisor as its basis? But it's, the hypervisor to me sounds like something that's closer to the bare metal. Mm -hmm. So what, what, how do you get your bare metal communication knowledge through that? Well, no, this is just what we're saying here is you wouldn't talk. If, if you're using this API, let's say you, you've coded something to this that wants to just crank out new VMs. So that's going to be talking then to QMU or KVM. That will be the instantiation of those, and those will then talk to the block device. So you're not talking directly with Nova. If you're talking to Cinder, then you're talking directly to the block device. There's, not, there's no intermediary between you. So if I wanted, I wanted to pin provision an image, and then take off the M um, of that image. I would first use the Cinder API to pin provision and then launch it with Nova, or can Nova actually do the pin provision as well? Nova can do that as well. Okay. Now, again, the. Go back to. Now, right from the Horizon GUI, though, you can't do that yet. That's fine. I'm just yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't confuse anybody. But those two have that in the map. Yes. So right from the GUI, you'll just be able to. RBD will be an option, and away you go. All right. We're. Thank you for your patience. We're coming coming down around the corner. All right. I get it. Okay, you're sitting there. I, I got OpenStack. I got stuff. What is what is Ink Tank? Okay. Majority of the Ceph contributors. Sage Wild, who is the CTO and the founder of Ceph, started Ink Tank with uh, some seed money from his former company at DreamHost, as well as some buddy Mark Shellworth and some other people, to create Ink Tank to ensure the viability of the Ceph ecosystem. So, what, is it, what does that mean? Well, we want to ensure that there's a company behind it helping push adoption and coming out to do things like this to talk to people about Seth. And what are the, some of the other things we do? Well, we're responsible for the Seth roadmap. I see this is the baby of, 
sage, but and he wants to guide it, but there's a whole community around Seth. And so we're kind of shepherding it with community involvement to figure out what new features should go into it. If there are any areas that people see that you know it's it's lacking that is keeping them from developing on it, then uh, we want to know about that. One of the big things that standing up in tank separate from Seth allowed us to do is to kind of formalize the development as uh, there was a recent article about why why does OpenStack do releases? Just the, the discipline of having quarterly stable releases and deadlines focus the mind. So here in May, we're gonna have our, our cuttlefish release. In August we'll have our dumpling release. And you'll see in cuttlefish we'll have incremental snapshots of RBD, which is Going to be very exciting, and then in August we'll have disaster recovery at the Rados Gateway level. So it'll be um, our implementation of that we, we like a little more than what we've seen from the way that Swift decided to do it. Is we're we're having a log that essentially looks at every transaction that you make and just copies it. So we did this transaction over here. Does that transaction over there? It doesn't do the R sync that causes so many issues that are there. There's a potential for issues with Swift. So what are we going to do then in November? We don't know, but it's going to be some really cool cephalopod name that starts with an E. Uh, in case we got the uh, tie between it, Sage went to UC Santa Cruz. Really likes cephalopods, squids, octopus. Things like that. So each of these names are a various type of cephalopod. That's the, where the name come from. One of the other important things that we do is we ensure quality of the product which releases. So we've got a pretty powerful automated test suite called Toothology, another Seth reference. And that is a, a suite that allows you to do all sorts of automated testing where you can say, I want this many OSDs, this many monitors, and then run a whole series of combinations of tests through it and then get the results back. And that's something that's open to the community to play with as well. You can submit test jobs to it. And develop a reference and custom architectures for implementation. So we want to be able to go out to people and say, here's what we think would be good based upon your system needs. And then allow you to implement it or have us help you implement it. And um, speaking of that, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our friends at Dell. So, Ink Tank is a strategic partner of Dell. And you can read all the uh, marketing ease there from. Uh, but the one thing I do want to say is we've integrated with Crowbar. Okay. So we're very excited to see Crowbar 2 on the horizon. So, and um, we've got a you know, little pick list, so if you want to order some Dell OpenStack powered stuff with uh, Ink Tank support for your Ceph system, you can do it. So what do we want from you? Please. I know a lot of you have played with it. Those of you who haven't, go take it for a ride. It's free. You know? Try to blow it up. When you do blow it up, <laughs> <laughs> go to tracker.sepp.com and tell us how you blew it up. That's that's how we go forward as a community. Honestly, that this is how, as, as an open source community, we, we can compete with the likes of the big iron people that I referred to before who are throwing lots of people at keeping their proprietary systems very proprietary. So, if you have any questions, please go to this link. It'll give you both how to sign up for the mailing list and um, the IRCs that we sit in. Seth is the, the obvious one, but it'll give you all the information there of where to find it. There it is. If you want to pull it down on GitHub, github.com slash Seth. And participate in the Seth Design Summit, which will be early May again, but we don't have um, the information should be coming out shortly, either end of this week, early next week. And it will be a virtual design summit. So 
everybody can come on, look at blueprints, come up with good ideas. Now, final request. So you saw the roadmap. We've got May, August, November that we're going to have those quarterly releases. Is there something that you and your system or something that you saw that you went, yeah, I know you said that um, you guys had this and Swift didn't have that, but I think you've got a hole here that, that you need to fill. Or here's something where I've had a use case that I don't think you've satisfied. And a couple that I threw out there just to kind of prime the pump are iSCSI. We, we, almost every time you get the occasional use, what about Windows users, poor Windows users? And then I take a deep breath. <laughs> I say, okay, if you're supporting, I know some applications have to run on Windows, I'm sorry for them, but then you can use, um, we've got just a real kind of prototype, would be generous, uh, thing that we've gotten into TGT that will allow you to play with um, having an iSCSI run into our RBD on the back end. So look, at, look that up in TGT if you want. But if that's something that everybody says, hey, yep, I really want that, got to have it, then I'll take that back and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll formalize that. We'll pull it in, we'll test it, we'll harden it. Right now, it, it's totally just a hack. Yeah. yeah, we have a fairly significant VMware installation with all our storage running on iSCSI. So that could be useful. Okay. We can consolidate down to a single storage solution. Have you had any discussion with uh, any members of the Sun team at this point for direct is DFS a, integration? That is a great question. We're actually <coughs> in the process. If it hasn't already happened today or tomorrow, and it's supposed to happen by the end of this week, we are, we've are we already had conversations with the Samba team, and we've got some stuff to push upstream to them. We should talk. Okay. By the way, shameless plug, the Samba XP conference is in Göttingen, Germany from May the 14th to 17th. Talk to my manager, I'd be happy. Any other requests? Um, on the REST API, um, are you basically Keystone only or can you uh, log in with other identity providers? That I don't know. I know we're compatible with Keystone, but I don't know if we have any. Is there one you had in mind? Oh, What's the use case there? Um, exposing uh, objects as URLs, kind of like S3, um, and, and being able to actually have a, a real identity provider. Uh, and, and not necessarily have to have somebody have a, an account in your domain. Do you provide any kind of pass connection? Uh, <laughs> I'll write that down. I think this right now, oh, this is probably the closest thing. And the Samba, you know, between the two, we're, we're thinking we can satisfy most use cases with Samba, Zips, or with. I suppose that most of the user space that would be worried about NFS could be satisfied by one of those. But if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll write it down. Yeah. Handling any additional placement logic, accommodating for CPU utilization, uh, device speed, block balance, and any additional type of logic. Because uh, speaking back to Rob's point of you know, having a homogenous pool versus heterogeneous, uh, you can get a little sticky as you iterate and expand and scale. So all the nodes talk to each other. Do they factor in anything about the network health? Mm -hmm. They do factor in the health of that. Well, they'll they'll know. I haven't heard from this guy in a while. It's but it's binary. It's I've talked to them. I have They don't factor in the quality of that communication. Right. And that would be nice. I mean, especially as you get to large environments, the network is so dynamic. <coughs> I guess maybe, maybe coming up with a scoring system or a weighting system, looking at the CPU utilization, memory utilization, disk utilization, network utilization, you know, voting that and something like that when deciding that crush algorithm. 
what happens in a situation where you've got a file system that's been heavily used for a long period of time, suddenly you end up with portions of it that are very empty because files have been Does it automatically do a rebalance? Do a tool that will go back and do a rebalance? No, you can, you can force it to do a rebalance, but it won't automatically. But it requires intervention. It's not a normally scheduled event. It's not like scheduled weekly cron to be a cron. Right. But it's not. It's, it's, I assume it's heavily maintenance intensive. Yes. What sort of analytics do you have um, in the second bar? That is a great thing that actually I, I kind of said admin API. And I just, that, that doesn't tell you enough of what we are, we're kind of fully opening the kimono, so to speak, and we're going to allow you via that API to get, I hope, just about any type of data you would want out of the system via that admin API. Do you expose stats that are blocked or anything like that? Today? I wonder how many bits and bytes I have written. Yeah, yeah, there's, via the monitor, there's some commands that you can get for that, but they're not that robust. But and you can, you, you can get via pool, I mean, you can get it broken down a little bit, so you can do a little DF via your pool as well. You can see the target devices as well. That's not going to tell you, you know, all the way people say I'm saying, right? Because you've become 82 copies of another single. Um, any um, thing on the roadmap on um, SSD caching or tearing? There is not. Yes. We'd love to see that. Okay. Compression? Do you do? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I know it's hard. Okay. <laughs> I trust you've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> so, speaking to that point, and again, maybe I'm just thinking of slides just in my head. Since you write on the file system, the file system could support things like that caching and, and dedupe and compression. You don't want to do it again, right? Yeah, how do you reconcile the file system? Yeah, the file system doesn't have a global view of what's in the tech. It's just what you have to do. It could do a dedupe block, right? But odds of that, that block be, it could do compression, it couldn't do dedupe, but like that it also Yeah, exactly. It's going to do it at a block, translated block level versus the object itself or the. Do you have any external uh, <coughs> customer references both via somebody who's implemented via OpenStack and maybe somebody who's implemented outside of OpenStack? I do. If you, if you want to talk to that person, I can get you What about QoS? Can I say I want to store this block twice? I want to store this block five times? It's super important. Okay. Can you, are there any particular workloads on that are well suited or poorly suited for the um, the block interface through the, the through Clumps Nova or through uh, on the virtual machine side? I mean, databases, mail servers, high transactional stuff, lots of locking, all good. Yep, performs great. Actually, if you want, I can I can take your information or I can. Send out maybe a tweet a link to we're putting together a performance paper that we've done on, on RVD and block devices. You can it through kingpack.com or Ceph. Yeah. Sometimes we put stuff on Ceph, sometimes we put stuff on anything. So you mentioned you mentioned two companies that you're going to have out of business. <laughs> <laughs> that both was me speaking, them, not anything. Both of them taught you know, sheer raw performance, and both of them have some large installs to, to back it up. So what's the I mean, when it comes to sheer gigabytes per second, what have what you guys proven? I don't know the top line number off the top of my head. Well, but it's going to be enough to form quite a few different guesses. I have throughput. And you're asking at the file system level, or are you asking which file system level is good? Have you done any scalability assessments? We have. And architecturally, we've not seen any limitations. Um, it's a matter of the, the inner OSD communication and 
how much memory and CPU you're going to have on each of these individual servers. The biggest thing is network throughput because of those OSDs having to talk to each other all the time. If you're on a very slow WAN, this is not a good implementation for you. Is all that traffic IP? Not during UDA or anything. Well, actually, we're, we're only doing IP right now, but we're looking at doing RDMA. Can you break out the network so you can have the network for the underlying management property? The, that, that was one thing I didn't cover. I kind of glossed over at the beginning. The, the monitor traffic that's kind of telling you what this here, there, that traffic is totally separate from the data traffic. So that's nowhere in the data path. You were um, thinking along the lines of our end to end data protection, like it's intended to any more than one. It's also known as D10.5. I don't know why they do those names. So I heard QLS based on replication. What about QLS based on performance? That's this image needs. Let's get this through. But You guys left off a little bit of object storage about uh, expanding beyond the land out to run replications across data centers across one of businesses. You guys started looking at that. We, we're looking at that. It's on a. It's not on the roadmap, but we're looking at it. Is that as we look at ones? as we look at data replication for the using the, the gateway. <laughs> so that's a harder problem to solve. All right, I, I don't want to overstay everybody's time. I, I know uh, you gave me about 30 to 45 minutes. I've now, according to this little timer, taken 47 minutes. So uh, I'll give me one last slide here. If I can get to it. All right, that, again, it's just my information. Pick one, it all gets to me. And uh, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. And if you have any questions or specific situations, please come talk to me afterwards or send me an email, tweet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. This was awesome. Yeah, I guess. No, I enjoyed it. Um, and then uh, I think, you know, Next week, everybody knows that you know, the big the big event is happening uh, once a year, uh, Open Stock Summit. So probably half the room will be there. So we'll see each other there. Um, uh, can we plug our sessions? Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if they're right, I, if, we did a little session, we did a little session about Open Stock Summit the last time around. But uh, if there are people in the room that want to plug sessions, obviously. yeah. Actually, I think it'd be really useful because we have a half dozen people here. Who's going to the summit? Awesome. Off the road. Great. Um, so yeah, if, if you're doing a session or a part of a session, please stand up and, and talk about your session or whatever it's ever doing a panel. Um, so please, please do that. So I'm uh, one of the co-authors of this book here, the OpenStack Operations Guide. It's a book we wrote in five days. And <laughs> that's, that's that, I think <laughs> my quality very yeah. well done. Yeah, it is, and it's actually we wrote it more like in three or four days, and spent the other day and a half to editing. So we actually gave a shit about this book, um, and we're gonna do a panel on it on Tuesday at five twenty p.m. So come out <clears> and you you can see all the authors. The first sixty people there get a free printed copy. <laughs> Uh, that must be. <laughs> <laughs> that might be on the website. <laughs> My name is Calvin from Rodmark at Dell Cloud and Services, and I'm doing a session on a legal system session on Tuesday about integrating the open stack with an enterprise and integrating the open stack with science providers and some of the other business support services, and you can make it a little more like online. So I think it was just a bit of um, is there any, like anybody has any sessions that they're going to super excited well, about? Top one. Well, top yeah, I've, I've got like three. Yeah. So. <laughs> is that I, I, I'm the chair of the operations track, so uh, part of part of my job was actually helping get speakers, you know, pick speakers, speakers put together some panels, um, and so I actually have a talk about reference architectures and using OpenStack Heat, along with Monty Taylor, and I'm sharing this presentation about. 
using heat as a way to describe reference architectures to make it easier for people to talk about how they operate OpenStack. So we're actually using OpenStack to describe OpenStack, which is sort of cool. Um, and then we also were put together at the last minute. Unfortunately, it conflicts. No, we moved your session, right? Or do oh, we not? The, uh, the Monday morning? It's, uh, on Tuesday at 520, we're doing a session on interoperability. So we pulled together a last minute panel because this is it very is at the same time. This is at the same time. Um, so check out the recording. But um, <laughs> so uh, interoperability, uh, there's some stuff going around in the press about. OpenStack making a priority of helping OpenStack clouds work together, be interoperable. It's a really real objective for the foundation. And so we're, we're doing a panel on that, which promises to be really interesting and pull together some, some interesting people for that. Um, and then there's something, I don't know, my schedule's crazy for OpenStack. Um, but there's, I mean, the, the sessions are incredible. It's going to be impossible to choose where to go at any one time. It's just, <laughs> Ah, uh, there is a hard, there is a, a reference architecture hardware panel, um, and yeah, we and we've got so we've got that. We've actually got a DevOps panel going. So we pulled in. We actually we had so many, we had twice as many speakers as we could take, um, and so I pulled a couple of people who were doing uh, DevOps and continuous deployment into a panel. So we we were organizing that yesterday, or this this afternoon. Um, that's that. Those are really exciting. Uh, panels. Yeah, I'll, like um, I'll be moderating an SDN panel. Uh, Software defined network. Yes. Yeah, network. Uh, we'll have uh, Dell will be on the panel, Medicare uh, on Big Switch, a number of others. Uh, so that's, and that's uh, Wednesday at three forty. Right. And Scott, no, you're not. You're not doing the session. Okay. We've got quite Thanks a. Right now, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not this time. <laughs> So, any others? Any sessions that people think are really exciting that they they want to call? Um, Canonical have a keynote. Um, Robbie Williamson will be giving a session on how we use OpenStack on our production systems and the infrastructure that we host to work with the Canonical. Awesome. Sorry, so I just don't forget the parties, right? RSVP, or you're already you're already behind if you have an RSVP. <laughs> this awesome. is like South by if you don't get in Pretty beforehand, you're in trouble. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, thank you for coming, everybody. It was awesome to see that many people. And, uh, see you next month. Do you know what our next topic is? Is it book jet? Actually, I do not. Yeah, oh, we have we have you? We'll just watch the meetup page. We're probably going to update in the next two weeks at minimum.